His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello, and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. Today we break out all the microphones to bring you the story of a man, his plane, and a very fateful day. So let's start by going around the table and introducing you to our four very special guests. Hi, I'm Amy Tuttle. I am the youngest child of test pilot Bruce Tuttle, who's the subject of this particular podcast. I'm Chris Ryan, Port Jeff Village historian. And uh, in 2017, 2018, we had the Grumman uh, show, and that's what led to uh, all our discoveries about test pilots that were involved in, in Port Jefferson. I'm Bob Larrabee. I helped uh, Chris and other folks out with the Grumman show, and that's how I got involved in the, uh, the Tuttle event. And uh, I'm John Hiz. I'm the Beltair historian, and I'm also an aviation enthusiast. And we are sitting in the Port Jefferson, I don't want to misname it, the Port Jefferson... So this is the old Chandlery building for the Bales Boat Yard. Okay, and we are... If, and we're in Port Jefferson. Port Jeff, if I turn my head, I can look right, out the window look at the, right uh, out, or the right sound. across from the village center right. on the east side of uh, Port Jefferson. So we're, we're going to reveal this as we go. Amy, do you want to tell us about your father, his, his history, and then we'll, we'll get his, his activities as a test pilot with Grumman. We'll, we'll work our way up to that. Okay. Uh, Dad actually was a, a native Long Islander. He's the grandson of... Hal and Edith Fullerton, who uh, were Long Island Railroad experimental farmers. So there's a very deep history on Long Island with, with the family. Uh, he grew up on the farm. Uh, the farm that they were living on when he was a little kid uh, was right up the road from here on Gnarled Hollow Inn. It was called Laurelope. And when he was a little kid, his mom ran through the orchard, grabbed him by the arm, said, come, look, look, look. So they went to the highest part of the farm, looked north and west, and they saw Lindbergh making his flight to France. So that experience really stuck with Dad, and that's what made him decide, well, I think I like this flying thing. So as he got older, and he maintained his interest in flying. Um, he joined the Marines during World War II, became a fighter pilot, decorated fire, fighter pilot in the Pacific, and he continued his flying career by becoming a test pilot for Grumman after the war. Amy, I'm just curious, because I've talked to the children of, of World War II vets, how, how much did your father ever talk to you about his, his war experience and his experiences flying? Uh, he actually was very proud of being a pilot. And he would talk about uh, a lot of the non-combatant uh, experiences that he had. Um, like all young men who are in a combat zone, they were definitely traumatized by a lot of what they saw. So being a good dad, he didn't want to traumatize his kids by talking about some of the, the, the worst aspects of war. But, you know, he, he'd made some good friends. Uh, he had, it really was an adventure to be halfway across the world and flying these aircraft. So, you know, we'd, he was pretty modest about his accomplishments. I found out a lot of things later in life. And as he got older, he would be a little bit more open about the things that he had, had been through. But he was still pretty reserved with uh, the more traumatic aspects of it. And, and what did, how did he describe his day job to you? Or what did you know about him, like going off to work with his helmet? Or, like, yeah, I'm going to fly this jet today? Or uh, We would know whether he was going to fly, whether he would go to Bethpage or whether he would go to Peconic. Because Calverton was where... A lot of the flights, test flights, originated from. But he always left home in a suit and tie. And we would know if we were around if he was flying because he would buzz the house. 
And, and where was that mom. house? Where were you living? We were living in Stony Brook at the time. Okay. So so mom's dishes would rattle and she'd kind of mutter under her breath and, and put the dishes back. <laughs> but we knew dad was around. So Amy, your, your father started working at Grumman when? Uh, it was after the war. I believe it was 19... 19- 49 um, when when he started. I, I'm not 100% sure of the date, but I believe it was 49. Okay. So, John, give us a, a quick recap. Grum, Grumman existed before the war. So Grumman existed where were they? before the war. Um, they were originally lowing aircraft located in Manhattan, and they were uh, a team, Leroy Grumman, Jake Schwerbel, and a host of other characters were working for lowing. Uh, Lowing eventually sold the business to Keystone Aircraft and moved the operation to Pennsylvania. Uh, This was in 1929, and Leroy Grumman and his associates decided that they weren't going to move, and they stayed on Long Island uh, and decided to stay in the aircraft industry and set up Grumman Aviation October of 1929. And that was when the great financial crisis hit America. And they survived through that, and they grew, basically selling what they could from box trucks to amphibians, and and eventually the Navy gave them their first contract, and pretty much the rest is history. So they were, coming out of the war, they were known for the Hellcats and the fighter, they were making fighter planes mostly for the... For the. They were making a wide variety of, of, of aircraft, and they weren't only selling it here in the United States, but originally they were selling it all over, and, and most of their amphibians were sold uh, in South America. And so um, they did uh, make the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Avenger, which was the backbone for the Navy in their war in the Pacific. And they were known as the Iron Works due to the ruggedness of the aircraft. And so what, what kind of work would test pilots have been doing? In, in, so right after the war, what was Grumman working on? What were they flying? Well, once the war was complete, um, the company downsized tremendously and Leroy Grumman and his associates were looking around for work. And they knew in the back of their minds that they had three options, and the one option was jet aircraft, the second option was jet-powered missiles, and then the third option was continue to uh, develop amphibians. Uh, So what they did was they were given a contract by the U.S. Navy to develop an all-weather jet aircraft based upon the current engine design that they had, which was a Westinghouse, a very rudimentary engine that only produced limited amount of thrust. So they tinkered with it a little, but the Europeans, specifically the British, the Germans, were way ahead of the Americans in turbojet development. As you could see with the Messerschmitt ME262, that was fully operational at the end of the war, and it surprised many of the B-17 pilots to see this fast jet, you know, uh, traveling through the sky at high speeds. Uh, So what they were able to do is they were able to coordinate with the British to get what is called a Neen engine, a turbojet engine, and bring it to the United States and then take a look at it and fit it into uh, the Panther that Bruce flew on that fateful mission or that fateful flight test. Which, which is what we're leading up to. And, John, just, just to clarify the Calverton Bethpage difference in terms of the facilities. So were they both places airplanes could take off and land? Or? Yes, as uh, the development of jet aircraft required longer runways and the density of the population in and around Bethpage, Uh, It was decided to look for a piece of property that was flat and away from the congestion. And probably sometime in the early 1950s, uh, they were able to secure about 4,000 acres out in Calverton, which, you know, over time developed. And they had sufficient uh, runway space. And they did all of their manufacturing. So the aircraft in question was designed in Bethpage. Uh, The first test flight occurred with the five somewhere around 1947, 
and Corky Meyer didn't want to land at Beth Page because he felt that the runway wasn't long enough. So what he did is he went to Idlewild, which was now JFK, and he landed there. He discovered that, okay, this is okay. I can uh, put the brakes on and, and, and land sufficiently, turn around and came back to Beth Page. But as a friend of mine who is originally from Beth Page, his grandmother back in the late 40s would always yell at Leroy Grumman for making too much noise. Yeah. Okay, so it was, it was something that had to be done. And so they moved all uh, assembly and flight test out to Peconic, which became known as, as, I guess, Calverton. Okay. And we're making our way to a December morning or afternoon in, in 1951. So just to recap, Grumman is developing jet planes. And known as the Panther. This is Okay. What, what's the full designation? Just for the, uh, the one that, in, that we're going to talk about is the F-9F, F meaning fighter, 9 being the series of aircraft that Grumman uh, was developing, the F being the designation for Grumman itself, and the five being the five in the series of aircraft. And, and I hope we've we mentioned, Corky, we'll, we'll mention other fighter pilots as we go just to get their names out there, too. But so there, there was a bunch, and Amy, I would assume they're, they were all veterans? Uh, all the ones that he was friends with were, were veterans, and most of them were Pacific veterans. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. So, uh, Chris and Bob, we're going to bring you in. So, the day we're talking about December 10th. So, we're talking about a specific flight that Bruce was involved in. Do you want to walk us through that day of what sure, you know? Of it? From, from what I know, and then I'll hand it over to yeah. Bob because Bob knows a lot more than I do. Um, you know, he was up at, I believe, 30,000, 30, 33. Right. Do, we, do we know where he took off from? He's Beth Page. Beth Page. Okay. I had, I had heard yeah. Amy say maybe East Hartford, where Pratt and Whitney were. That's where. He went. He took off from Beth Page, and uh, he was told to bring it up to Pratt and Whitney so that they could adjust the engines. So he brought it there, and that's where he took off from to do the test. Okay, so he took off from Beth Page, went to so Connecticut. So he was flying from Connecticut from over Connecticut, the sound, coming back over the sound back to Long Island. It, yeah. Explain to the layman what height he was at and like what out the altitude. And I think Chris said yeah, it was about 33,000 30, 33, feet. Yeah, he, um, he was doing these ex burst acceleration tests. Okay, which um, I guess were, were to test the performance of the motor. So he had to get and pretty it, high to do that. Yeah, and he I, apparently they were instructed to do them at different altitudes, and he I think he did one at thirty. He went up to 33, did one, and it, what they call, flamed out. And he tried a series of restarts, cycling the, uh, the ignition and everything. And um, apparently he did about 12 of them, trying to get the engine to restart. And then uh, he decided that he was going to ditch, apparently ditch the plane. The, the cloud ceiling was around 3,000 feet. Okay, so he's well above the clouds at that 30. Yeah, percent. but yeah. then he, he re well, he realized, uh, and the other issue, like John mentioned, was th there was no really long enough runways to do an unpowered landing. And so an unpowered jet at this time, is it falling? Is it spiraling down? Like, what is he doing? Uh, well, he's trying to, uh, apparently from the accident, accident cards, he's trying to restart the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, does is is the plane sort but, of stable at least? Like, yeah, we're, we're, apparently, yeah. I'm not an aeronautical engineer, but as I mentioned to Chris, anybody that I've talked to that had an aircraft mishap, they basically fall like rocks. So you know, in most cases, a yeah. tense situation. Yeah, very tense situation. He was able to control uh, his descent by using flaps, slats, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and also on, yeah. speed brakes, yep. so you can slow it down. Uh, and then probably do what is a controlled crash, glide, you could call it, and uh, also probably dump fuel, lighten the load. Um, this is a 10,000-pound aircraft without any fuel in it, 17,000 at full capacity. And also, he's a test pilot, you know, cool, calm. At 28. Yes. 28, wow. He was yeah. 28 years old, yeah. And then Grumman told him to eject. And I know John. John will mention this. That you you know that they uh, they didn't want to eject, right? Uh, 
ejection seats were in the early stages of development. And in most cases, you know, you had a 50-50 chance of, especially in a jet fighter. At that speed, yeah. At that speed. And the rudimentary design of ejection seats, having the rocket motor in the seats operate on top of, you know, it's a sequence of events. Canopy's got to go. Ejection seats got to go. Drogue chutes got to go to stabilize you. You got to disconnect from the seat and then pull your parachute and then hopefully everything goes well. And at this point in time in the development of ejection seats, I believe most pilots were probably a little reluctant Skeptical. to take that ride. Right. But, but the opposite, you know, the, the alternative, I should say, to that is, is this gliding into the water. And this is not, you know, gliding like you might imagine. This, so he had no power. He was right. You're probably a, going a few hundred miles an hour when you hit the, hit the water, right? And then falling... At the, at the same time, so this is no easy uh, choice. And his documentation that he prepared for Grumman in the Navy, I, really only two days after, kind of goes through what he tried to do. You know, I, I won't read it all, but he says, uh, next attempt at the restart made at 22,000 feet with no success, tried all combination of primary emergency battery and generator emergency battery positions with no success, Deliberately sprung the throttle in start detent several times to actuate ignition micro switch. Battery voltage remained excellent, still had 23 volts at approximately 3,000 feet until air start attempts were abandoned after approximately 10 to 12 tries. So wow. he was continually trying to restart mm -hmm. the motor. As the ground is getting yeah, closer. Yeah, turned and closer. off fuel master switch at 3,000 feet and prepared to ditch, open canopy and lowered flaps. At 1,500 feet with 170 knots indicated airspeed, dive breaks up. Dive breaks up, okay. Landed two miles off of Port Jefferson, about 20 degrees out of a 15 to 25 knot wind. Wind-driven swells were three to four feet. Last observed airspeed was 120 knots indicated airspeed. Plane hit nose high and sliding nose section popped open and slid forward about one foot. Plane bounced off level and landed again. Nothing seemed to come loose. Unstrapped myself and turned off battery and prepared to abandon plane. Plane with 3,000 pounds of fuel sank in 30 seconds. Picked up okay by SA Converse after 10 minutes. So was he in the plane when it hit? He didn't hit the ejector button? He was in the plane. He, he did a water plane. landing, and it was a little similar to what we what we described. But that's airmanship, because a majority of of mishaps are are in most cases fatal. Uh, one thing that I had found out just last year, and I had told Chris this, was when the cowling blew off, it caused his parachute to deploy before he left the plane completely, and then he realized that the string of his parachute was still attached to the plane. So the plane's going down, and he has to get rid of that parachute, otherwise he's going down with the plane. One part that I do remember is he dropped, you know, he, he saw a hole in the ceiling of clouds, right? And he dropped below that, through that hole to see what where he was exactly. Actually, that was yeah. a TWA pilot who was taking off from Hartford. Oh, right. Who right. saw the hole in the clouds and noticed a splash. And he radioed to MacArthur. There was a, an air traffic controller, a female air traffic controller, who was monitoring air traffic and chatter, and he said, I see him. I see where he went. Right. And she re relayed to Grumman and the Coast Guard. Uh -huh. where he was. So they triangulated and got him got him pretty quickly. Right. And then they sent a goose, right? A Grumman, an amphibious Grumman goose over. And so, I, yeah, go ahead. So was he in radio contact with Grumman the whole time? I think he was. Yeah. So they knew what he was heading yeah. for. Right. Yeah, they okay. told him. I yeah. have here Connie Converse. Is that the? Yeah. Connie Converse came out with the goose in eight minutes. So they picked him up, and I guess he, he had a you know one of those yellow dye May packets. West. May West life. Right. Preserver. Okay. Yeah. And you also have to remember, uh, I don't know if you had an exposure suit on, but this is December. Yeah, it's cold. So water yeah. temperature is probably in the 40s. No, he, had his, he had his flight suit. Flight suit and with no exposure suit. Yeah. And what was, when did he hit? 120 knots. Which is. Like a little, it's, it's more in miles per hour, right? It's yes. 1.15. Which is quite, right, quite fast. Right. 
Normal and, landing speeds are with the Panther coming onto the carrier was about 90 miles per okay. hour. And he mentioned the swells. I don't know if that was high for the day, but was was it a choppy sea? A choppy it, it's yeah. it's high if you are up to <laughs> yeah, that's here. A good point. And, and with in it. just your your head and the top of your May West above right. above water, you're still a foot and a half below the top of the swells. So you mentioned Connie. So Grumman had a had planned like they must have had to always, be prepared to, always, to do this type of thing. Always, and it depends upon what type of uh, flight he was on. Uh, normally, they would have a chase plane that would follow him if it's a experimental aircraft. And I remember Hal Shepro telling me that a bunch of Navy guys came to to Calverton to take a a C one over to. Providence, uh, the Naval Air Station. And Hal asked them, do you want Chase? And they said, nah, we don't need it. Those guys never came back. Oh, okay. Just to show and, how and, it's and, dangerous. And, and, and nobody knew what happened to them. Whereas you have a Chase aircraft, you have a pair of eyeballs and saying, you know, you got a flame out or, right. or you got some problems. Or like this TWA flight that said, hey, I, I got eyes on him or yeah. so where he hit. Yes. So, so Chris, give us a geography lesson where, well, first of all, any are there any accounts like in the paper someone looked up and saw this happen? or? I don't know. Bob, did you find any accounts yeah, in the was, paper? Let me give you the mic. There, there was... The newspaper articles were, were pretty brief. They had a nice picture of them uh, with a blanket around them, I think. Uh, and some of them had them more to the, to the west, off, off of Oldfield Point. Other, people, uh, other reports just said two miles off of Port Jefferson. Um, it was not really specific where, you know, where exactly he, he ditched. And what, what kind of boat traffic would, would have been expected at that time of day that year? In December? Yeah. N- None. Enough. <laughs> Maybe the ferry. I don't even know if the ferry ran in the wintertime mm-hmm. uh, at that point. So there's Do we no, know like, what, yeah. no local boat that could have been like, hey, It I'll could go. be, but it's very, very, it's very light now. Yeah. So I'm sure it was very Bob, light. Bob, do we know what time this occurred? 2 p.m.? Uh, it, was, it was about 1, uh, the military time they use, uh, 1358. Almost two. It was, and, mon- it was a Monday. I looked it up. And so he was in the water how, how long? Ten minutes. Roughly? Uh, around ten minutes. Okay. I so think, yeah. co- we mentioned Connie, who was, I think, the head pilot for Grumman? Or? He was he, uh, chief test pilot. Chief test pilot. And so he came out in the rescue. You said it was an amphibian, so a plane that could land on water, basically. Which is dedicated to Safety. search and rescue. Okay. So do you think he was up in the air at the time? Well, I think that when Bruce knew he had a problem, he immediately relayed Grumman and said, hey, I have an issue right. here. Mm-hmm. And then that began the process of the search and rescue, and they were probably on the ramp engines running. And so we, we have a picture here. This is from the paper, Chris, that you have yes. of him in a blanket. That's at St. Charles, I believe. So that, that's what Very I happy to be alive. <laughs> so they dragged him out. Wrapped they, in a blanket, wrapped yep. in a blanket. They took him straight to the hospital here? Yeah. You, get, you see the scratch across his nose? Yep. What you do not see <laughs> is the cracked vertebrae Ooh. that he suffered from the rough landing, which he did not tell Grumman about. Because he didn't want to be grounded. So he slept on a board for a year so that he wouldn't be grounded. Yeah, in the paper, it's just, just a mere scratch on the nose. So he wouldn't That's, go, yeah. he couldn't see a doctor about it or, or didn't want to. But you said but, he slept on a board for the, yeah. rest of, uh, the rest of his life instead of a, a mat or a board under his mattress. Uh, he slept on a board for a year, and then he slept on a hard mattress for the rest of his life. Yeah. Do you remember? I, I don't know your date, so is this something you would have experienced on the day, or did you hear about this after? No, I came along uh, four years later. Okay. How did he did he relate it to you, or as a family story, did it ever come up the day he crashed? He would just, you know, kind of joke about it, saying, well, it took me a year to warm up, you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh-huh. But again, very, very happy to have survived it. He said the reason that he chose not to eject was because... He didn't want to take a chance on the plane landing on anybody in Setauket and killing them. So that was one of the things the test pilots were very, very cognizant of civilians and civilian life. And they didn't want to do anything that might endanger people on the ground. So if we go back to that day, there's a very expensive, almost experimental craft that's has sunk. So what, what's the initial response? I, I guess Grumman wants their property, or is there... What, what happened to the plane? Let's talk about the story of the plane. Well, first of all, you know, who, who owned the plane? And John can tell you that um, the, the plane was not a Navy plane at, at that time, right? 
Or I'm was not a hundred percent sure. It, this is 1950, 51. Late 51. 51. Yeah. Late 51. December 51. Normally, what would happen is prior to delivery, you do a test flight, and then once all the systems were operating correctly, you would get out of the plane. You would give the information to the Navy and say, check off, and then the Navy would hand you a check. So it may have been a Grumman aircraft still, uh, not so, a Navy aircraft. And is there a protocol? Like, do they usually try to recover wreckage? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, this to was find state, out what happened. Of, this was state of the art. They, yeah. don't want anybody, yeah. they, they don't want anybody else looking at it either. But there was a report that you mentioned indicating that the Holly switch was, I guess it's a, a pump, a fuel pump failed. Oh, yeah. The, Na- the Navy wrapped it up very yes, quickly. Yes, very quickly. I mean, In b- terms b- of the cause of the, yeah. cause of the yeah. incident. The, yeah. uh, I'm trying to think. And, of the... and, and how they came to that conclusion? They had other issues with the plane. From what I remember reading, I think in November, uh, a pilot was taking off in a Panther from Quonset Point in Rhode Island, and he had engine trouble, crashed, and was killed. And then I think another one was taking off from Floyd Bennett, and he had a problem, and he was, he was killed. So they knew they had some issues with what they call the fuel control. And they kind of just wrapped it up saying... Um, that was the cause that, that was of the, the issue. Yeah, that Hol- was the issue. Holly Move fuel on. control yeah. valve yeah. made by Holly Carburetor Company in Detroit, Michigan. So, Chris, again, I was getting back to the geography. Talk us through where, give us some landmarks for people that know Port Jeff Harbor. Where okay, so Port Jefferson obviously is in the north shore of Long Island, and it's, it's a long harbor. I think it's about two miles, two miles long. So we're talking about outside of that harbor. Okay. Out in, now, the, in the open bay, that, or sound, out in the sound. In the sound, right. So it's about, what, 80, 80 feet deep, we were thinking, yeah, where he went the, down? The, the, Navy, the Navy reports give the water depth as 80, 85 feet. Okay. It's actually the uh, coordinates that they gave were slightly different than Amy's oral history from her father about the, this, the salvage attempt. The, the Navy reports just said an unsuccessful salvage attempt was undertaken by the 3rd Naval District. So they sent a boat or something out to yeah, look for it. Yeah, and that is it uh, as far as that. So, Amy, anything you would add to, in terms of the, the story you were told or, or other information you had? What Dad told me was that the when the plane sank, it sank on the first shelf off of the shore, which was in, what, about 20 feet of water? Well, I think, yeah, I think at, at, at median tide, it's about 10 feet. And then it's... Not so much the shore, the shoal. The shoal, yeah. yeah. And then um, it slid down to the 80-foot depth, but when it slid, it slid between a couple of the very large boulders that are, you find at the bottom of the sound. And that's why the Navy diver could not access the plane, he couldn't get there. He was sent down to retrieve the black box, and he couldn't get close enough because the plane had slid between a couple of boulders. And but, he, he was, but he saw the plane? Or he, he saw it. Okay. And, and he also reported seeing a Russian sub lurking in the distance, which wouldn't be surprising considering they were aware of Groton, and they were often reported being, being spotted off Groton. And that's not that long— Long a trip from there to here. Any any corroborating? Well, a- a- Amy stuff? had also gave this other little tidbit that 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 diver or a diver was sort of famous because he recovered a gun for the police department in New York City. Twenty two so, at the so, bottom of the East River. So, yeah, so I took good. a crack at that, but I came up with nothing. Just searching the archives of uh, the New York papers. So, yeah. John, I'm just curious, what do you make of the story of the sub, and does that fit in with, with Grumman concern about that, those kind of issues, espionage? and? You know? um, at the time, the beginning of the Cold War, I think that everybody was concerned about that. So that may be valid. Yeah, it was a, it was a year into the Korean War. Yeah, I think 19, the Korean War started yeah. in 50, and this is late 51. Sure. Yeah, this is, you know, state-of-the-art technology. But right, early jet development. Right, early still. jet development, but you, you, you know what the British did? The British wind up selling the Neen engine to the Soviet Union. The same engine that was in the Panther was sold to the Soviets. So the Soviets then developed the MiG-15. Mm-hmm. The Americans took that Neen engine, gave it to Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney redesigned it 
and put it in the Panther in the five. And the Panther and the MiG-15 saw action against each other over Korea in 1950. The Panther wind up shooting down the MiG-15, which was the first Navy jet air kill uh, in history. Okay. And then, Chris, just local legend-wise, or, or what do you yeah, know? Yeah, I think from... we're, we're getting to the point where the plane <laughs> is down there, and we don't know where it is. We just don't know. And we don't know why we don't know where it is, because it's not that deep. And we, we know of another wreck, similar depth, similar time, similar size in the plane, Grumman plane, a Guardian, off a, a Baiting Hollow, which is completely, you know, is intact enough to be identifiable. And that's, and, in, that's and, in the water. And it's in the water. So we've got lots of questions. That's what, and we've been looking for, looking for this plane, and we, we can't find it. So we also enlisted, enlisted um, the help of uh, Roger Flood over at Stony Brook. He's a marine sciences guy, and he helped us a little bit, uh, but we could not image the plane at all with, um, with the existing um, NOAA, okay. NOAA mapping. I subsequently got a hold of a guy, Ben Roberts, who uh, does sort of private side scan work. And he, those, he was kind of a diver, and those guys are always a little secretive. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm going over on the sound. Can you give me the coordinates of the plane? And I said, yeah, here's the coordinates, but I also have this oral history that it might have been Mount Misery Shoal. And how, how, how big a difference is between those it's, two? It's a maybe a quarter mile away. Okay. So he said, yeah, I'll go over there and run some scans for you. And it turns out he was looking for the Lexington, the steamship that oh, burned. Okay. He did do some side scans, but he, he didn't find it. Yeah, one of the questions was, you know, could it have drifted across the bottom? And, and was it covered with sand? You know, yeah. and the shifting, you know, the shoal there as, pro, you know, obviously a dynamic thing, you know, with sand shifting around. Or, you know, is it under 40 feet of sand or is it under 10 feet of sand or whatever? I mean, the Guardian wreck, you could just, you could very clearly see it on the maps. It's obvious. It's, it's a, a plane. Yeah. yeah. It's very, it's very easy yeah. to the, see. The other scenario is they, they might have just tried to blow it up, you know, so there wasn't any snooping Nothing around. But... Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, you, you mentioned some events you were doing. So... Where was this story in Port Jefferson history? Was it something people knew, or was it kind of buried? No, I, I'm not sure. You know, how much did people respond to this story when it happened? Or, or I mean, just over time, so like in modern-day Port people Jefferson. People don't know about yeah, it, okay. simply. You know, when we, when we talk about it, people are like, really? Right outside the harbor? I said, yes, yeah. A panther went down, and we never found it. And, of course, that piques their interest. Yeah. And, and, Amy, the whole story of... of pilots on Long Island, that this whole Top Gun school of pilots that your father was part of. Do you tell people about it? Do people know? Or, or what would you like to see that people's knowledge of this you know, become? The, the kids of the fighter pilots and the test pilots uh, will talk to each other about it. Um, once Grumman moved off Long Island, uh, a lot of that traditional kind of family... Right, right stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that kind of went away when, when Grumman went away. But it was so intensely involved with so much of the aerospace industry. I mean, Grumman was involved with designing the lunar landing module. Dad was part of the design team in the, the early days. Uh, there was a lot going on in the aerospace industry. So, uh, you know, with us kids... We just kind of accepted. Well, this is this is normal. Everybody's dad and everybody's mom mm -hmm. works at Grumman. Did, did you think your dad was cool? Oh time? yeah, dad. Dad Good. was cool. My <laughs> godfather was cool. Uh -huh. I mean, we we have we should mention we have um, a pilot's helmet here, which is your dad's, right? Do you want to just explain to us this and his call sign? Uh, this is a well-worn. I guess you'd refer to it as a crash helmet in in uh, in layman's terms. Uh, it's got a visor to shield your eyes from from sun glare, and written across it in magic marker in quotes is "salty," which was the nickname that he got after they they picked him up out of the sound. <laughs> so that was his call sign, or the, uh, he yeah. was salty. And, and and you know this, I think I knew it, but I forgot. But so anyone that knows Top Gun, those is a different era. But those were Grumman planes. Just to show you the the lineage of of these people, kind of goes through the space age and into the you know modern military age. John, what would you say about 
Grumman's legacy. Do you want to give us some some thoughts uh, about that? Absolutely. I, I think that it it still exists. Uh, they're still in business. They still have operations on Long Island, even though it's a very smaller scale. But I think that with the reintroduction of the movie Top Gun and the reintroduction of the Tomcat in that movie, which is Grumman's uh, famous cat, um, that legacy still lives on. And there is not a person that you won't talk to that would say, hey, that's my favorite aircraft is the F-14 Tomcat. So, so that legacy still lives on and will continue to live on. And it's known for its robust aircraft design, the ironworks. Chris, any thoughts? Yes. On well, I just wanted to, to talk about what happened when we opened this show at sure. the Village Center in, was it 17? 19. 2019. Um, we had no idea what the response was going to be, but it was overwhelming. It was like Long Island woke up and in my office every day people were coming in with dad's papers, with with trinkets, with models. It was unbelievable. We went from, oh yeah, let's do some Grumman pictures on the wall to, you know, we were going to, to Beth Page, we were picking up models and people were just coming out of the woodwork and the pride that these people had. They worked on the lunar module. They worked on these, they, they knew about these aircraft. It was all about their family and their dad. And Grumman was such a tremendous company and so good to families and it was like we we just woke the whole place up people had you know they said we can't forget what Grumman was to Long Island and it was just uh, a tremendous experience when we finally had our our panel there were 350 people in this little room and it was just overwhelming and I got up at the microphone and, and I just stopped for a second. I just said, wow, you know, I, I can't believe all these people who have showed up. It was standing room only. We had people outside the door, and they all wanted to hear. We had panelists. They all wanted to hear about Grumman. They all wanted this last kind of show of Grumman. And, and I do want to add that we took the whole Grumman show. It went down to um, Patuxent River, Patuxent River uh, Naval Air Station for, for a while. We, we lent in that came back it was sitting in my office for a while and then recently john and i just took it over to the uh suffolk county museum oh, great. and they're going to set up an exhibit so with all our photos and mm -hmm. all the research that we did amy just another final thought question what, what do you think your father was most proud of of his accomplishments or that he talked about the most i guess uh it's tough to say just one he was proud of a lot of what he did he was very proud of being a marine pilot he was very proud of being a test pilot. He was very proud of, of the friendships that he had with the other test pilots. Uh, they, they were some of the closest friendships that I've seen of people in that generation. They were just unabashedly proud of each other. They would rag on each other when they made mistakes, and, and you, could, you could feel a very deep emotion whenever they heard about another pilot who didn't survive a test flight. Everything about them would change. They'd get very, very quiet. Um, Dad and a few of the other test pilots at Grumman had been asked to be part of the Mercury program. And yes, they did call astronauts spam in a can. And he said, I don't want to be in anything that I can't control. And I believe it was this crash that made him very much aware of that. Even though he was able to control his descent, that's the kind of thing that a lot of people don't realize. You know, there's a million ways for a test pilot to not survive a mishap. And these guys understood the risks and they would do everything that they could to ameliorate the risks because they wanted to stay alive and, you know, they loved their families. They wanted to be around for their families. You could definitely see it in their conversation when one of them didn't make it because they were putting themselves in, in the other guy's shoes. Yeah, no, it is an amazing story. And just to think of the, the arc of aviation history, I mean, we talked about him seeing Lindbergh in 27 up through the 
World War II and the lunar module and Top Gun. So I think people would know in the back of their minds that there's an aviation history on Long Island, but this really lays it all out on the table, the, the, the depth of it. It's amazing. Well, it, thank you all for, for having us in. It, it's a great topic. We'll keep in touch with you if, if new items come to light or wash up on shore. Uh, Amy, thank you for sharing your, your father's memories with us. Uh, an amazing guy, it seems, and it, great to hear it. And hope, hopefully we can spread the knowledge a little bit, too. And I would like to really thank Chris and John and Bob for delving into the Grumman history with such enthusiasm and passion. It really has sparked an interest in the community, like like he said. And, you know, for those of us who grew up around it, we really, really appreciate it. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I want to say thank you to Bob and Amy and Chris and John for sitting down with me, sharing all that history. A lot of action and drama it took a couple of turns I didn't expect. We will have links in our show notes to related resources if you want to follow up on the story or learn more. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. And I'd like to invite any listener who has a story to tell themselves your own connection to Long Island history or a project or research that you're working on, reach out to us. We'd love to have you on. You can contact us at longislandhistoryproject at gmail.com. We've got to always have a few things in the works, but we're always looking for people passionate about Long Island history. It's all there in the intro. That does it for this episode. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening.